live in three, two, one. Hi, everybody. Thank you for playing this podcast or video podcast, whatever you want to call it these days. Thanks so much for joining us again. We are in a Forza second home, the London Waterloo Brewdog podcast booth. And I'm really excited today because I'm joined by actually a dear friend and long term colleague and an Forza board member, uh, Lindsay Armstrong. Lindsay, thanks so much for coming today. You're welcome. Nice to be here. Nice to nice to be seeing you in a pub at nine o'clock in the morning. It's always a good place to see you. A lot of the podcasts have beer, but the day is water. <laughs> 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 Lindsay, it'd be great maybe uh, to get this thing kicked off with just a little bit about yourself and your background and um, your your career journey to here to sure. this pinnacle of being in a podcast. This pinnacle of being on the Aforza board and podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, I, right now I do uh, board positions and board advisory. And the way I got to that is probably a little bit circuitous. Um, originally, I studied law. I was a lawyer. Uh, and then I was a trade union lawyer. So uh, I did a lot of work uh, in the Northeast in the trade unions. Finally realized that that was probably not going to be the way to make a lot of money. So I ended up going into um, uh, a tech company. I went to McDonnell Douglas. I was a contracts lawyer there. Mm -hmm. um, I got on a sales program there, uh, started to sell. Um, I was really terrible. It was hardware. I could not figure out how to do hardware. A friend of mine had gone across to uh, Oracle and he called me up and said, this is so simple. Even you can sell it. So come on over. So I uh, moved across to Oracle. Uh, I was in Oracle for a long time. Then I went to New York. Then I did a startup in New York, um, which was um, very interesting. It's like one of those, you know, the heady days of like yeah. early startups. We got ourselves acquired. I uh, came back to the UK, um, built that business to, you know, a couple of billion uh, dollars. Uh, and then uh, moved across to Salesforce where you and I met. And then after Salesforce, retired to, to do this. That's my potted history. That was a good pot of history. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually quite, you make it sound just like I did this and did that, but actually it's quite impressive, <laughs> Lindsay. It has quite a career job. Like a lot yeah. of the, um, I know we're going to talk about the the world economy and things that are going on it right in a, in a moment, but you know, there's a lot of people play these podcasts actually, because we're, we're quite fortunate. We get kind of a lot of interested people like your good self coming on um, and, and it'll take like little career inspirations from it. But like, like you know, um, I say this respectfully, like, you know, for your career history, which is not quite prodigious, like that's quite a switch from law to technology, from hardware to software, going to New York. And when you did it, like, I mean, and hopefully this is a, this is a compliment, right? Not many women were doing these things in those days, right? That's, that, I mean, that is true. It's, uh, I'm looking at the camera now. Don't do this if you're looking for a career. This is not the thing to follow. It was really interesting at the time to yeah. be able to switch around. I don't know how easy it is for particularly young women to make these, these switches um, that, that I did. But I will say that law is a great grounding. Um, you know, so I can sit in any, in any deal now and yeah. understand what's going on and be able to you know, really translate that into, into what it's going to look like. But it's just a really good grounding. Um, but sales, I think, is just is a, great, it's a great profession for women. You know, it is. It really is. No matter no matter what else is going on in you know the environment, the net net of being in sales is if you sell something, then you're successful. And I like that egalitarian you know kind of rush to the top. Yeah. And it didn't really. It, it really doesn't matter so much in in sales about anything else that's going on or how people feel. You either sell something or you don't. Kind of binary outcomes, right? Results orientated. Totally yep. true. Yeah. 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 So um, you, uh, we're really lucky to have you on the board of a Forza, but you do other board work. You, um, you know, you you keep your um, ear to the ground with regard to what's going on in the economy. How do you? What's your general observations about what we see today, and what's your your views about how these things are going to play out? Because it's been, I mean, well, last few years it's like pandemic, supply chain, inflation, war banking crisis, like it seems to be like one thing after another. What's your, what's your take? Yeah, I mean, I think, the, I think the selling environment for all companies is, is pretty tough at the moment. Um, there's, there's definitely a headwind for everyone. I yeah. see, you know, what I see is all companies really kind of battening down the hatches. Um, the, the good news of this is I think uh, those companies that are selling painkillers versus vitamins will succeed. Um, and those companies who focus very hard on their customers, really hard, not in a not in a lip service way, but really genuinely 
want to make their customers successful, this is the time to get behind your customers. This is the time to really perfect, you know, how your customer success organizations work, because those are the customers. That's what will carry us, carry all companies. It's our existing customers that will carry us through these tough times, not necessarily the new customers. I think that's really true. It's actually interesting because um, in our like a f company planning, one of the things I move right to the front is like I always have the same values, which are like uh, customer success, trust, uh, growth, and human. And I used to have, of course, day one, the first thing was growth. But you know, today it's customer success. <laughs> it's like nothing is more important. We've got yeah. to put our arms around because all the, one of the things I think that um, you know we focus on the target industry: consumer goods, food, beverages, consumer healthcare, um, and like I just spent all day long kind of worrying about the challenges those companies are facing because like like they really have to contend with stuff like supply chain and inflation. I mean, it's a crazy, crazy situation. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a really tough environment, both for sellers and for buyers. And I think when you think about customer success, I think it's not the old metrics of customer success that we would think about, you know, or, or, you know, the, the kind of the standard KPI dashboard. I think one thing, that, again, that, that companies that win in this economy will understand how to be flexible with their customers. And what does that mean? Well, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, I mean, all companies have rules. Everybody has rules about, you know, you're in a, a multi-year contract and in, in, you know, year two is bigger than, than year one, year three is bigger than year two. We're going to have to get flexible because these companies are not hiring the numbers of people or doing the kind of business that we anticipated when we signed those contracts. And if we don't generate that flexibility and we don't generate the empathy with the customer situation, you know what we're going to do? Not sign multi-year contracts. So we're going to shoot ourselves in the foot if we are not flexible enough to bend, and I'm not suggesting that we kind of, you know, give everything up, but I am suggesting that we listen and we're super flexible to what customers need right now. And they'll remember, people will remember. People remember. If you, if, you know, if, if it generates trust and long-term partnership, if you can really, yeah. like, I, I agree with that. It, yeah. it generates a loyalty, that it generates a loyalty beyond the normal relationship that you have and beyond what's on the contract or what's in, or, or what the expectation is, it really does. And that's what we all need to do right now. Because to your point, your customer, I mean, if we think our lives are tough, your customers' lives are incredibly tough. And our job is just to move a little bit of, you know, grit out of the engine of their life. If we can move just a tiny bit of grit out of that engine, everyone remembers. And it's great for the industry generally. I, I really, really agree with that. One of the things that, um, like in the consumer goods industry right now, uh, Lindsay, is like, I actually, well, let me, let me take a step back. I think that if we really think about our just day-to-day -day lives and what we, we, even ourselves, personally experience, the general public, you know, we see inflation, we go in the supermarket, like things are going up in price. Um, and for a lot of people, this is like, that's hard, right? Like that's really affects our lives. It's very challenging, it's probably very stressful for people. Um, it's happening at a, a time when the economy is at best flatline. Um, but I think what can be often forgotten is you know, the companies that are making these products to put those things on the shelf, they're facing supply chain issues. Mm -hmm. They've got like cost of goods is going up, um, inflation is going up. They're getting squeezed because the retailers are also under huge pressure. And I think it, it, like and we saw a study recently by Accenture, like no industry is affected by inflation and margin pressures like consumer goods. And, and I think it's easy to forget just how hard these guys have it. Yeah. They're really struggling to try and make all this work. They are. And yeah. I mean, I think I would kind of turn that around and yeah. say, what is it that you, you know, uh, what is it that you bring to the table? Yeah. And, you know, I'm going to ask you personally, but yeah. I think that's what people should think about. Yeah. Because we, we often talk in sales, you know, identify the pain. And actually, that's just not enough now. You know, it, you know it, it's kind of like going to, like going to a, a psychotherapist. I feel your pain. Feeling someone's pain isn't enough. What you need to do is be able to do something about it. So, you know, in many ways, I've turned that question around and say, you understand their yeah. pain. Well, so what are you going to do? What can you bring to the table? And how can you make, you know, take that little bit of grit out of the engine of their lives? Uh, well, Lindsay, that, that is something we think about all day long in the Forza. And that's why, actually, like with the software we're producing today, we're thinking about how they can control margins, but what can what can you control? You can control price, you can control promotion, you can control placement. But many of these companies today are really struggling with this because the systems they have in place can be very manual, very stovepipe between headquarters and the field execution processes. What we're figuring out and doing with customers like Destel and Transmed is how to connect these different 
areas together so that we can do end-to-end -end execution in real time and see where, where um, we can make changes to control things immediately. Because where you place your product now is so much more important. Tell me how you've adapted um, your sales methodologies and techniques to be able to deal with this different environments. I'm really curious to see what, what CEOs are doing and how they're kind of flipping the sales motion around to be more, more um, responsive to customers. Lindsay, yeah, thank you so much for asking it, actually, because this is something I like. I've been spending a lot of time on recently. I think one of the things we have to do is um, myopically focus on the problem at hand. The problem at hand is margin control. It's margin control. This is it, right? Everything. There's a million other things that stem from this, but that's the thing they're all facing every day. And, you know, they're obviously trying to run their businesses now. The airplane is in flight. Like, the changes they can make are somewhat constrained. They can't stop flying the plane to change everything. And so what we've been working on is ways to actually engage with our customers where we can target one particular area, one place that's safe to start and to build from success very, very rapidly. And what you see is, for example, um, customers will focus on um, one area, perhaps like telesales for one product category in one market. And then from that, you can then rapidly move to field sales or other channels, but you do it secure and safe in the knowledge that it's working and that you see the benefits. And now you can do things like discounting control that you couldn't do before, suddenly on other channels, and do it all from one place in real time and tweak as you go. So, so to answer your question, I think uh, succinctly, I would say it's about um, finding the right start position. It's about making a proposal that is consumable by the customer. They can see it, they can see success, it's safe for them to do it. They can see immediate improvement, and it's about how to grow from there. I think that's the way to do it. And I think the other thing is, is um, in, in the world today, um, it's about things that you can achieve results in a very, very rapid time scale. Nobody wants to spend $10 million on a three-year project mm -hmm. for some esoteric value that might happen somewhere down the line. That's over. Like, that's over. Maybe those are the yeah. things that you and I might remember from like 20 years ago. But actually, what people want to know is how's the safe journey that I can make an impact in my business now and do it. And I think, I think that um, we talk about sales in the 21st century now. I think it's incumbent upon us to really have a partnership mentality, especially these days with our customers. Like, like to really understand, like, like I'll give you a, a, an example. We might get um, a customer say, I've got 20 markets. And I need to do this trade promotion management project. Well, that's probably true. And you probably want to solve in those 20 markets. But let's be honest, probably you want to start in one market first. So just make sure that the proposals and the plan line up with a sensible way with achievable objectives. Kind of common sense, actually, when you think about it. I mean, it is common sense, but you'd be surprised how many people don't don't yeah. operate common sense. Yeah. I, I really like this, this kind of narrower, more targeted and focused land and expand. Because again, land and expand, in the past in SaaS has always has always kind of taken the format mm. of we'll land with you know 10 users and expand to 100 users yeah. and this is a different take on land and expand and I think it, it speaks to a different way that, pe that, that, that customers are going to buy I think the buyer's journey yeah. is massively different than um, than it was a few years ago and that means that the seller's journey has to adapt to the buyer's journey rather than expecting the buyer's journey to accept to, the, to adapt to the seller's journey I totally agree and I think I think the trick now is the land and expand is, we often talk about this, but I think I think now these words are more truthful than ever. It's a win-win partnership because the expansion only happens if everyone's winning. And I think that creating that value and continuing to add the value for the customer is kind of a key part of the formula. And when you going back to earlier in the thing we we're talking about, that's why customer success is a number one value. It's why actually we're invest, continuing to invest in it quite heavily. And the partnership between that department, sales, and everybody else is key. It has to be highly integrated team across all functions to pull this off. It, it does. And the, the value, again, when we started, we talked about customer success yeah. and, and changing KPIs. And if you look at the tradition, a lot of the traditional KPIs for customer success are around how many users are adopting it. Yeah. And really, again, we need to flip that. It's what value are they getting? And the frequency of value has changed. Again, it used to be enough to have a, you know, a quarterly update or a, a you know, twice yearly update. And you would kind of accelerate those updates as you move towards a renewal period, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, the, but, but I think in the new environment, the renewal starts the day they sign the contract. 
that's when the renewal starts. And we've forgotten that we have to start working then for the renewal. There is no waiting period you know, to start Lindsay, for that renewal. Totally correct. I think I would say, you know, um, we often talk about trying to make our customers real time with the software. We have to be real time with our customer relationships, yeah. which is kind of ironic because like, we're the tech industry, but we need to adjust the way we think. Well, I mean, we're, yeah. our, our entire selling process is, you know, is works against the buying process now. So I think, you know, we, we need to adjust the tools that we're using or how we're using the tools. And, you know, sort of a, a great example of that, um, that, that I think almost everyone does is, you know, customers now are 70% down their buying journey by the time they interact with you. And what's the first thing that we do as, as sellers? We put them in a stage one and give them to a junior, um, a, a junior employee to talk to. So a customer thinks they're 70% down the buying process. We're like, hold your horses, mister. <laughs> we, we, we got a selling process to go through here. Let me get you to a stage one. You know, we'll qualify you. And, it, you know, it was, we're very out of sync with these processes. Yeah. And I think the other piece that we're out of sync of with, and, and this is us as sales leaders. You know, I, I, again, I don't know how many meetings I've, I've, I've been in where someone says, um, you know, so who's the decision maker then? Well, I mean, there is no decision maker now. Decisions are, are very rarely made by individuals. Decisions, are, you know, happen in this sort of recursive, move, movable feast of lots of different people and reselling the same thing that you think that you've sold. So again, as we think about how we, as sellers, talk about this, we talk about a deal which is a stage three or a stage four deal. Well, only parts of the deal might be at stage three or stage four. Other parts might be at stage one and some parts might be at stage five. And we don't we don't use that kind of terminology as we think about selling. And that's what I mean. And, and that's why when you get to the end of a, of a deal and there's a surprise there, it, it's no surprise to the buyer. <laughs> you know, the buyer isn't surprised by the uh, fact that they're not giving us a deal on the 31st of March, you know, at midnight. It's us. Yeah. And we're surprised by that because we are not following the buying process. We are trying to make them fit, you know, a, a, a linear selling process that we're all used to. I don't really know what to say to that, except I think probably those comments, I think in this economic conditions, it's probably exasperating that actually more than anything. Because for the customers, things are changing rapidly with their challenges, yeah. which means that, you know, whatever, whatever they thought they might have wanted on day one, it's probably changed by like, you know, three months later uh, with the situations they're in. So much covered there as brilliant. So let's try and, try and wrap, bring this all together. Really, I think a lot of this is today understanding these customer pains and as a salesperson, you've got to have an opinion on it and you've got to have a recommendation. Uh, you must have a point of view that you truly believe in that can help that customer resolve those pains. And we're going to bring this all together in our webinar on March 23rd, particularly focusing. We've got a very strong opinion about margins, about how to accelerate margin control for our customers. We're going to do that. But Lindsay, as I thank you here for doing this, I really enjoyed this, web this uh, webinar, this podcast. But I want to bring it back to you for any final remarks and to say thank you, by the way, for doing this. Oh, you're welcome. It was great fun. I mean, I think, you know, if I kind of sum up with the changes that we've seen in selling, one thing that always strikes me, and that is that as we've moved much more towards like, consultative partnerships, so this kind of consultative sell with diverse voices makes us really strong in front of our customers. It gives us that point of view and it enables customers to take us seriously and listen to us. And that's really what we want in that kind of partnership. Really, really agree with that. Lindsay, thank you so much. Good job. Well done.